The following program may contain coarse language, violence, nudity, mature subject matter, or scenes which may not be suitable for all viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. All hit radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. How are you, William? Nice seeing you. Yeah, nice seeing you again. Um, you're been, you've been researching Bigfoot or Sasquatch for the past 25 years. And uh, any luck on finding him yet? You ain't going to find him on the ground, that's for sure. <laughs> you're not? Where are you going to find him? You're not going to be able to study him physically. There's no way. They're, they're not as populated as most animals. They're very smart. They're very well camouflaged most of the time. And uh, it's just almost impossible to do it on the ground. So how do you do it? I don't do it yet. I'm working on a project called the We Can Hear Them and using many of mics, about 40 microphones, wireless, to listen, not stop looking, because mm -hmm. I waste a lot of time. I spent like five years out in the wilderness. You know, I've had an encounter up very up close, I've tracked them, I've seen tree twists, I've driven up on one and smelt them, and you know, you just don't have a very long, uh, if you do encounter one, it doesn't last long usually. Uh, I was fortunate enough to see one up close and structurally it was the most amazing animal I ever seen actually. I was what, what, did, what did the Sasquatch that you, that you had the encounter with look like? Structurally it was primate. Hmm. Yeah, the arms are long, the hair head to toe, and you know they don't they say they walk like us, but they really don't. If they walk towards you, usually when you see them walking sideways, it looks like they're walking like a human. But if they walk towards you, you'll notice their balance is 10 times better than ours. Their, their feet are more in, in like a tightrope kind of position like you do in a, a DUI test. Right. Uh, and the, the balance is unbelievable with these things because when I left my camp, they walked up the hillside, and it was just amazing how fluid it was. It was just unreal. I mean, it was just unreal. How tall would you say the uh, the uh, Sasquatch was, and what do you estimate is his or her weight at? Uh, 6'4", 6'7", 450, 500 pounds. My goodness. Uh, do they have a distinct odor? Uh, when I had my encounter, no, but when I... Uh, was, I did five years of gold mining out in the wilderness in the Sierras of California. So after I had my encounter, I spent years, I never told anybody what happened to me. So I spent years myself doing research as I was mining out there mm -hmm. to prove to myself uh, what happened was real. And they do exist. There wasn't no fluke in nature. And yes, there's a lot of evidence out there that points to, yes, this is real. However, at the end of the day, we don't have proof. No. Why what. do why, why do you think they've become such experts on you know evading mankind? Uh, there's you know you can ask questions all day and you can ask mm. people questions, but truthfully, nobody can tell you the truth because we don't know everything about them. But just my opinion. Right. It's, it's very possible thousands of years ago they were hunted uh, by humans. It's, you know, traits. Everything becomes a trait with all animals. You know, like a uh, perfect example, where does a, a fox live? It lives in a hole usually in the ground. That's a trait of uh, these things uh, were another trait that these things have are 
the Indians respected him spiritually, and the Native Americans did, and they'd leave gifts. And gifting wasn't created by uh, us. It was created by the Native Americans because they left gifts out because they spiritually respected them. And uh, they'd leave stuff. And this is well known over the years. And it's kind of interesting. You know, something comes out, takes stuff and leaves something. Uh, I'm a visual person. Right. And for me to believe something, I have to see it. And it's uh, where I stand at. Um, there's another example tracks why we don't find a lot of tracks I'll give you an example the immigrants that come over the border they will wear shag rugs over their shoes mm -hmm. so they can't be tracked by the immigration right now these creatures my opinion from what I've seen has very heavy padding on their feet and when their feet lands on the ground it spreads out and that's why it doesn't leave very much uh, evidence of tracks, unless it's muddy, dusty, soft dirt. Other than that, you're not going to see a track. Um, I tracked one that was less than seven hours old one morning, and I tracked it upside the hill, and I learned a lot by tracking it. Was mm -hmm. the, stri the stride was very interesting because it was about three and a half feet. And once I figured the stride out, I could see where every step was, but without a track, you could see where a stick was moved in the dirt a pebble was moved over and you could see the um, the uh, stride where the foot landed and then it crossed a mining road old mining road from the 1800s and there was a print right there in the middle of the road it's big enough for a truck to fit through about a foot on each side left over and it took a step from the side of the mining road to the middle to the other side and it was just unreal. It was, a, it was like having a sighting, I guess you could say. And it, was, it, was, it rained till 2.30 in the morning, and I knew it was less than seven hours old because there was no raindrops on the, on the track itself. None, zero. What do we actually know about Bigfoot? Do we know any of its habits? Do we know what it eats? Or is it just total speculation at this time? No, well, you got it right. You did speculation. You hit it right on the nose. Uh, there's nobody out there that I know of that can tell you, honestly tell you what they are, uh, what type of creature it is. I can just give you my opinion, what I've seen, mm -hmm. my right. thoughts, and that's it. And I'm more on the primate side because of structure. And it's, my encounter was very interesting because it came down a canyon. I'm mining in an ancient riverbed up in the Sierras. I'm out in the middle of nowhere, and it's all quartz rocks. And it was dark at night, but the quartz in the background on the hillside, anything in front of me, I could see. And when it got up close, I could see it structurally. When it, I got to see the front, side, and back structurally, and you're talking about a heavy-duty animal. I mean, meant for the wilderness, let me put it that way. The the Gimlin Patterson film. I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, how how did that Sasquatch or Bigfoot compare to the one that you saw? It didn't look exactly the same, mm -hmm. but pretty close. I can say that. So you know that's another reason I think they're in the primate family is because you look gorillas and chimpanzees and everything mm -hmm. like that. You gotta understand a primate don't have tails. Monkeys do. Right. That's true. Yeah, so a lot of people don't understand that. And there, there are a few primates that do have a tail, but the, the gorilla and the uh, chimpanzee, chimpanzee and the uh, baboon don't have tails. Those are primates in the primate family. So, you know, this is another reason why I'm on the primate side. So tell us about this new wireless technology that you're using in order to try and discover who, what, when, where, why Bigfoot is. Okay. Basically, I went out in the woods a couple of years ago, got to hear some recordings of tree knocks, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, I had a few questions. How, you know, they, they leave mics out in the middle of nowhere, then pick them up and then listen to them. And if there's a tree knock or any noise on there, you hear it. And there's five tree knocks that was collected, and I got to listen to them. And mm -hmm. 
they were basically uh, what got me was uh, consistency consistency in sound was remarkable because that's kind of unusual you know a branch breaking falling on the ground makes a sure. different noise yeah you know, but these are all consistent and within a three mile radius of the same area so yeah about three miles so my question was was how far away was it and i couldn't get an answer and what direction was it and mm -hmm. i couldn't get an answer so after i got back i started thinking you know if you can answer these questions, you might be able to solve a mystery here. And triangulation of sound is where I started at, and it took me six months to figure it out. So I went through so much headaches and calling. You ever heard of a shot spotter in the city where the gun goes off, the police knows exactly where the gun went off at? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I created. I created many of them. Wow. And it's, yeah, it's, uh, well, if you want to buy it, it's like 30,000 plus if you want to buy it. So I built mine for like 750 a piece and <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> it's, believe me, it's a lot of work to put it together and it works. But uh, when you have about 40 of these mics out there and they're all wireless and they're going to laptops, uh, sound travels about 1.3 feet per millisecond. So if, once you start calculating where the sound hits and you have more mics, a lot more mics, you can know just about exactly where that sound came from. So then you add in the thermal drones, you have them park. You don't see, we're listening. We're not looking, we're listening. And you have drones parked a little bit higher up on a hillside vantage point to, on the area that you are working in. And then as soon as you hear something, you, you're doing calculations, you already know the area where the sound came from automatically. And then you do the calculations as they're heading in that area. And I can probably put them in the spot like the size of my front yard. So you send out three drones. It's a lot, they can cover a lot more and also at different angles. You really can't hide from them in a way. And if we do get on something, what we do, we have a relay system. We got 10 batteries for each one and we get on something we have a relay so all right i've got to take a break please stand by bill great having you with us and um exo nation our guest this hour is william barnes he doesn't have a website but he does have a facebook page that is we can hear them so we'll be back on the other side of this very short break with our guest this hour william barnes talking about using technology to look for Bigfoot. I'll be back. Don't go away. And welcome back, everyone. William Barnes is our special guest. His Facebook page is We Can Hear Them. Uh, Bill, you've got 41 microphones that you've strategically placed in areas that you believe uh, that are frequented by, by Sasquatch. And you also have drones that are standing by, so when you get a, a hit on one of your microphones you dispatch your 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 drone and hope to find bigfoot how successful has the uh, system been working well the microphone system works really well the drones we're working on to get right now we only need four uh been working on this for two years now mm -hmm. and when you say uh searching we hunt for we're very mobile with this system. It can be put up and and put down, uh, took down and put up in just 10 hours easy. Wow. Move, move to another area. And we hunt for active areas. And once you get in an active area, you stay in as long as possible until it's not active anymore. Uh, in the Sierras, there's so much land up there, it's unreal. I mean, I got a place up there I've, I've known for 25 years, 20, about, about yeah, 20, 20, 24 years pretty active it's like a crossing area from fall and spring uh, the upper part and the lower part of the uh, canyon they come in and then they leave when the winter comes up but it's a it's a pretty remote area most of my mining was very remote when I was doing my research for convincing what happened to me that these things are real um, I do have a website by the way coming up in about 48 hours it just finished today uh, we can hear them it'll be it'll be on the search engine in about two days. 
Oh, good. Well, yeah, well, yeah. Well. I've been working on it for a while. Um, the uh, idea is, like I said, is just to listen and stop looking. Because mm -hmm. when you watch all these shows on TV, these Bigfoot shows, 80, 80 to 85% of it's all sound. And That's right, know, yeah. What happens is, is you don't get to see that. They assume what it is, and at the end of the show, they lead you to kind of believe we're almost there to come watch the next show. Um, this happens all the time. Sure. So my thought is, is I want to see what makes these sounds. I don't care what it is. You know, I'm on a tree about, I mean, I'm on a fence about tree knocks. And mm -hmm. this is a two-way street for me and everybody else, even for the non-believers and believers. If tree knocks are made by these creatures and I can find out, great. If they're not made by these creatures, made by something else, great. You know, it's a, it's a two-way win on that. And, you know, I, I've never seen one hit a tree uh, with a stick, but, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm on the fence. It's very possible that they do it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, you know, they're predators, too. You also have to remember that. Um, predators are... The, like I, I spent five years out there and never seen a mountain lion. You know, they're very, uh, they can hide very well. They see you, but you don't see them. You know, I think it's in the same uh, category in a way because I think they're predators. They do eat, I mean, I can't tell you they eat deer, kill deer for food. I can't tell you that, but people have had many sightings where they killed a deer or other animals. And, you know, if they are predators, they're very good at it. Um, there's another thing about primates and, and with gorillas. If you read up about gorillas, they never sleep in the same place every day. Hmm. Yeah, they never do. They move. They keep moving. And so also, what? I'm sorry. No, no, go also, ahead, Bill. And also another thing about gorillas is that they have a adrenaline gland they can control. It's very musky, just like uh, a Sasquatch or whatever you want to call it. I call them wood apes is what I call them. Um, primates have the same ability to do that. Uh, gorillas do when they mm -hmm. get spooked or show a power. And they can turn it off when they want to. There's a big study on that. And, you know, like my encounter up close, about three feet away, I never smelled nothing. But when I drove up on one, and spooked it, I smelt something. And it was very putrid. It was very, I, I smelt a lot of things in the wilderness, but nothing like that. And I used to go to that spot every night at the same time for cell phone reception. The smell wasn't there the night before or the night after. It was just for that moment. Bill, you've been in the, in the uh, outback, for lack of better words, for many years, uh, have you come across any any uh, remains of bears or deer or other animals in your travels? Nope, only a dead squirrel in the creek. Huh. So uh, my, my my I was going to ask you if you had seen any any remains of, of Bigfoot because that's one of the questions that that all these other Bigfoot investigators can never answer is why haven't we found a the remains of a Bigfoot? Well, let me put it this way, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, if, if, you, I got, if you go to my Facebook page that's up, there's an interactive map on there that shows all the sightings and mountains. It's two maps they integrate into themselves. It's very interesting. It shows all the sightings in the mountains. Um, if, if you don't have a, if they're territorial, it's just opinion, mm -hmm. and say they have a thousand square miles of territory for a male, female, and a juvenile, just just calculation wise. Yeah. If you do the woods of just California, the forest, there'll only be about one twenty to one thirty. That's it. Now, hmm. if it's five hundred square miles per, if it's five hundred square miles territorial, you're going to have about two forty, two fifty, two sixty. So the idea is to. Find, get on, find where one's at and study it as long as possible and see how big the territory is. And then you can do an educated guess on how many there are. You know, if there's not that many out there, 
what are the odds of you finding a skeleton out there? Not very good. Do you have any idea or any theory on where the origin of the Sasquatch originates from? I have to go back to primate, and I think it might have its own family tree. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's its own type of primate, I guess you could say. They're smart. I mean, they're curious. You know, but, you know, you got to understand, a lot of people think they're part human, um, and they have portals they go through and stuff like that, and they add in flying saucers when they have a sighting. Forget about all that. I agree. Yeah, it's... They're 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 an animal, flesh and blood, and you know the reason why all this comes up is because people can't figure it out, so they got to add something to the story to make it right. Half give it a it, give it a point of reference, right? Well, they just want to have an answer for something why we can't study them. You know, they they can disappear, they can cloak. You know, I mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that. When I seen what I seen was a physical animal. I mean, there was nothing special. I mean, I can't say there was nothing special about it. But when humans look at something that's bipedal like us, yeah, what do they do in their own mind? They have to be part human. And that's, yet, that's so wrong. Yeah, I think it is wrong. Uh, but then again, I can't tell you what they are. I mean, it's only my opinion. Mm-hmm. But I think they're very, I know they're very smart. That part I do know. They're very smart. They, I've interviewed over 100 people, and I had a couple of them with encounters close as mine. And one hunter told me a couple of years ago, he said he drove to a spot on his quad, and he seen one go tree to tree, large tree to another tree. And he waited till daylight, and he left. And I said, you didn't go behind the tree? He goes, no, I didn't want to see it. That's his third encounter, by the way. Uh, he lives way up there in the Sierra. He's been up there for years. And he said, I said, did you get the smell at that time? He goes, yeah, I smelled it. Yeah, because he spooked it. You know, like, that's the reason I go back to gorillas, because they do the same thing. And that's the primate side of it. I mean, I don't know if it's a primate primate, but structurally, you know, if you go by the arms, the hair, mm -hmm. and different... Uh, People see different faces, but if you look at gorillas and chimpanzees, they don't look all the same. We don't look all the same. No? No. You know, it's in the same trait. See, if, if you use traits to try to be able to study these, you have a better chance. Bill, what's your opinion on all the different uh, Bigfoot hunters, researchers that, that go out and try to try to find Bigfoot. Uh, the, the, the level of professionalism, I think, in all of these hunters is very low. I think they use it as a weekend getaway more than anything else. Are they, are they an asset into the research of identifying or finding a Bigfoot, or are they a, a menace to researchers like yourself? There's a lot of good ones out there. Yeah. Even if I don't get along with them or if they don't get along with me. But there is a lot of good ones out there. A lot of them are weekend warriors. Um, they're just hunting for the truth. And a lot of people do have an encounter. And what happens is they're trying to make that second encounter to see it again. And that's odds of that is kind of rough. Kind of hard, actually. Some there was a guy. Have, I'm go sorry. Ahead. No, go ahead. There was a guy. I can't remember his name. I think it was Biscardi. Tom Biscardi? Yep, Tom Biscardi. Who was, uh, who was out there, he had his truck all deckled out, and he was going to be the person to kill a Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah, I know. Whatever happened to him? I don't hear about him anymore. Uh, I don't know. I can't tell you, but he's still out there. He is, eh? Yeah. I, don't, I really don't keep track of all these guys because I have to look at uh, one direction because if, if you let people start telling you how you're supposed to do it, They've been doing the same thing for 50 years, and mm -hmm. where, are they at? where are they at today? Same you know, place they were 50 years ago. Yeah, so technology has a lot to do with this. I mean, that's the last resort we have, actually, other than shooting one. And I'm a no-kill guy. I agree with you. 
Yeah, here's no. a question. Here, here's a hypothetical question that I asked. I can't remember the guest's name. If it is established that Bigfoot is part human, and somebody goes out and shoots and kills Bigfoot, is that homicide? Well, it's legal in Texas. It's only state in the United States you can actually shoot one and get away with it. You're kidding. No, it's, but any other state, you don't have a license to shoot one. There's no permit, like a fishing permit or a deer permit or right. a moose permit. But Texas, yeah, you can shoot one. And there's our, our states that have laws about shooting one. But I'll give you an example why they don't get shot usually is because when people are hunting, they put their scope on it, they see something standing there, and they see something, look at them, and it looks like a human. Would you shoot it? Definitely not. Okay. That's I would I mind you I wouldn't shoot it if it didn't look like a human. Well, you know, when something's bipedal like a human and it's looking yeah. right at you through the scope and you're sitting you know, most hunters are not murderers. You know, that this is the reason why they don't get shot. Well hunters many hunters have encounters mm -hmm. with them because that's that's where they're at out in the wilderness. Um, they're hunting in canopy. If you go to my uh, Facebook page and see the map that's interactive, you'll see all the sightings in the mountains and in the tree canopy areas, and it's pretty accurate. I, you know, I picked a map that was a sighting map, and then I put a government map mm -hmm. underneath it, and you wouldn't believe how accurate it is. It's just where they live. You and I have to take a break, uh, Bill. Please stand by. Great having you with us. And Exonation, uh, Bill Barnes is our guest. Uh, he's going to have his website up in 24 to 48 hours. And, and Bill, is the website going to be the same as your Facebook page? Uh, no, it's a little bit more detailed. And also, I got my trailer. We had the trailer uh, built for the pilot. That was done a few months ago. Okay, yeah, super. Turned so out we'll really good. All right, we'll talk more about this when we come back from this very short break. And Exonation... If you'd like to visit um, Bill's website, I'm sorry, Facebook page, it's uh, We Can Hear Them. And we'll be back on the other side of this break. So whatever you do, don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. Bill Barnes is our special guest. Uh, his Facebook web page is We Can Hear Them. And uh, Bill, is your website going to be We Can Hear Them as well? Oh, yeah. We Can Hear Them dot com. Yeah. Excellent. Tell us about the trailer you built. Uh, I had a, I got a producer director that's been in the industry about 20 years, and I told him what I wanted, and he actually did a really good job because uh, he he kind of seen what I seen. I mean, a lot of uh, directors and producers they like to change things and make it the way they want to look at it, mm -hmm. uh, but he did it the way I the way I wanted people to see it. It was uh, he did a really good job actually. And it explains everything if you look at it. It explains everything from from beginning to ending. And, you know, I, like I said, we're working an area. You know, if I, if I can do about 300 acres plus, give or take a later, uh, away, that's a lot of land. See, and people can't cover that much land. I don't care who you are when you're out there at nighttime. Mm -hmm. But I can by listening. See, I can reach down in those canyons with these mics reach down because they're not directional but i block out one side it's pointed out say up the hillside or into the forest not the back side so i can reach down into these canyons reach into these forests on the hillsides and listen i can without being there and that's that's the advantage you have is that you can actually hear it if if they hit a, a golden uh sound would probably be a tree knock or you hear an animal scream or whatever. I mean, but a tree knock would be the best one to test it out on first to see what actually makes these tree knocks. See, I don't go out there and bang trees. I don't go out there and screaming or nothing like that. I never was into that. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, it works for some people, I guess. Mm -hmm. but for me, I'd rather hear it naturally. And uh, if I can hear it naturally and I can get on top of it in 60 seconds or less, I got a good chance to see what made that noise. So what would you do if you, in fact, were able to locate a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch? First, using the microphone, you get your area, your target area, you send out the drone. 
What happens next? Well, actually, I send out three drones at one time. And then if I do get on something of interest, I start a relay system. They got 10 batteries a piece. And this way I have about uh, six hours flight time or more, actually. And if I can stay up on, stay on top of it and study what I'm looking at and keep mm -hmm. all the footage and let people look at it and see if it ever happens and I do capture something really great, I'm not going to say what it is. I'm going to send it out to people, uh, biologists, and have them tell me what it is. Do you think the scientific community should get behind the Bigfoot investigation uh, more than they're doing? Uh, in a way, I don't think they will because uh, the perfect example is Spotted Owl. Mm -hmm. This is just my opinion again. Spotted Owl shut down the timber industry. These things live in the timber areas. And if these were known to exist, uh, I think they would shut down a lot of timber industry. And the people who oversee that, believe it or not, is the Department of Interior. They're above everybody. I have, really? Oh, yeah. You read what they do. It says timber on it. Department <laughs> of Interior. That's their, they're the head guys over BLM, Fish and Game, Forestry, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there was an incident that happened in Texas, and the gentleman, I guess he's dead now, he had the Department of Interior have him sign a non-disclosure agreement, and it was kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if the, the story was true, but I met him, and I got, he told me about it, and... Uh, you have to believe what you hear sometimes. Sure. Uh, but then again, if the government knows these things exist, which I think they do. So I have fish. I had a forestry guy out of Humboldt County had three encounters, and he was a re 30, tires, 30 years retired. And he told me if you mentioned them or talked about them, they'd put you in a corner or get rid of you. That's exactly what he told me. He had three sightings. He had a, a good sighting of a female that had a baby on this uh, chest up above the shoulder mm. carrying across the road in front of him on the, he was doing a study on uh, sparrows that come in during the summer and spring and they go back to the coast in the winter time up in california and he said he was eating his lunch he was logging a briar patch on a clear cut and he stood up and he said, I looked over and I seen a female. And my first question was, female? He goes, let me finish. And I said, okay. And he said, he stood up. He was cleaning his trash. He stood up and a female was standing there and it walked, was stared at him and then walked over to the forest line, disappeared. And it's not his first encounter. So mm -hmm. he wasn't really uh, freaked out about it. And then he said he walked down to his truck and started driving up the dirt road and here it comes across in front of him with a, a young one on its by its neck hanging on to the fur and that's that's from a forestry guy now you can't say the government doesn't know i mean if if they're real the government does know believe me there's too many people working out there but but if if they are real and the government does know shouldn't the government do something to protect it what's oh yeah well if there's not that many of them why should they and also why should they shut down the timber industry that's a lot all right but i understand that but uh there has been bigfoot sightings or sasquatch sightings in other parts of the united states and canada where there is no timber industry true canada has a law about shooting them too i'm sorry i believe british columbia has a law you can't shoot them that's right, yeah. So why would they put a law in place? Well, because the power of the people, yep. people who believe that Sasquatch is real, and the, you get a bunch of activists going down, knocking on the government's door. Oh, yeah. You know, and I also, there, there was this also this other person, I can't remember his name, who started a way, petition. By the way, Pardon? that was Todd Standing. That's uh, it, Todd, yeah. Yeah, I know. I read all the time. What you just... Uh, answered my question environmentalist yeah is the worst enemy to our government 
strongest well, enemy against our government. With all the uh, with all the people that you've talked to about uh, your your work and your research, is is there any one story that has sticks out in your mind that that just kind of was the added uh, drop of water to the bucket to say, yes, I know I'm on the right track. Yes, I know that we're going to get the proof that Bigfoot does exist. No. No. Eh? Yep. How do I, you know, how, how DNA, do you know where to put your, I'm sorry, go ahead, Bill. The DNA, all the DNA testing they did, that was so flawed, it was un, unreal. Um, I was disappointed to tell you the truth. And you were just going to ask me what areas I should, what areas I would work? Yeah, and how do you how do you know which area to go to? Well, after five years out there finding evidence of them, I have areas where there's activity of these uh, known activities. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, I speak to the community, these small little communities that have the people live there have encounters, and a lot right. of people I talk to are actually marijuana growers, but they don't want to tell anybody where the encounters are about them and the reason why is because they're, they're gorilla growers and you know they don't want to tell people where they're growing their stuff at so I got to be friends with a lot of them they told me stories that just blow you away you know because hmm. they're out there all the time taking care of their plants and stuff and also gold miners uh, many of gold miners there's gold miners that live out there year round and I've heard stories from them that's just unreal just just unreal and uh, in my encounter, you know, I don't care if people believe me or not. I really, it doesn't bother me a bit. Mm -hmm. and the reason why is because, like I said in the beginning, I'm a visual person. And if I'd never seen it, I would have never believed it. And that's what kept Bill, me Bill, my producer is telling me that we've run out of time for tonight. I want to thank you very much for joining us. Keep us in mind and let us know how your, your um, high-tech research for Bigfoot works out. Oh, Oh, I will. Believe me, I'm, I've been working on it for two years straight now. This one, just this one idea. And it's getting well, you take care of yourself, Bill, and be safe out there. All right, XO Nation, that's it for tonight. I'll be back tomorrow night at 10 o'clock as once again we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exxon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And I'd like to thank my senior producer and wife, Laura Rogers, for all her hard work, Craig West in Master Control, and our director of programming, Mac Alexander. So until tomorrow night, my friends, always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Good night now. <laughs>